Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today um, to see Molly Lambourne talk about her artist practice. Um, it's going to be very interesting for the next hour. If you have any questions or comments, um, put them in your chat box. Make sure you've clicked panellists and attendees or you can use the Q&A feature which is located at the bottom of your screens if you want to be anonymous. Um, so over to you now Molly. Um, hi everyone, I just want to say um, thank you so much for coming tonight, um, it's really exciting to have you here and also just a huge thank you to Kirsty. Um, it's a really incredible opportunity to come and speak and um, I do appreciate it. Um, I'm sure you're all aware about Teb's gallery but please do look them up and keep an eye on what they're doing because it's very exciting. And also at the end, um, there'll be some information about how you can stay in touch with me and um, keep up to date with what I'm doing. Um, so I'm Molly. I'm a fine artist from Kent. Um, I'm 23 years old um, and I'm very new to this. Um, so today I'll be talking to you about my journey into the fine art world. It's been a bit unconventional, but it's going well. Um, so yeah, um, starting out, let me take you back to when I was 18 and I was doing um, a qualification called the International Baccalaureate known as IB. It's basically an A-level equivalent, but with more subjects and stress. <laughs> but while I was doing that, I, I was doing art and um, I was obsessed with my art. Um, I'd come home every day and I'd be constantly drawing. Um, I draw just lot, lots of very detailed things. I did a bit of everything. I did um, textiles, ceramics, um, just big drawings. Um, and I realize now um, that art was very helpful for me. Um, ho life at home was quite difficult. Um, when I was 16, um, my mum and dad split up and um, my brother and my dad, um, they moved out to a different home and my mum and I lived alone. Um, and it was a big change, it was a big upheaval. Um, and it had been years of sort of, you know, pent up anger and kind of drama in the house. And um, we never really told anyone about that, actually. We never, as a family, we were quite closed off. So everyone thought we were okay. Um, so it was quite a big change, actually. And I remember being really closed off. I remember um, not telling any of my friends I think until the day that I was moving and I just sort of casually mentioned it um, so it was a bit of a shock for people and um, yeah I remember my art really helping me through this period and um, I was making lots of work like this. Um, this piece here is called Map of One Existence. Um, it is the ultimate angsty um, map of a, of a teenager, basically. It, it maps everything in my life up to that moment, so around sort of 17, 18 years old. And um, it had all the key buildings from my life, um, key quotes, key books, um, songs, experiences, just emotions from in the moment. It was a real cathartic piece, um, and it's quite big as well. And um, I remember, I can't even remember how long this would have taken, a very long time, it's very detailed. And um, it, it really helped me process that moment in my life. Um, and what inspired it was the most incredible exhibition. And I stay to this day, I, I don't think I will ever go to an exhibition as good, I could be wrong. Um, but it was Grace and Perry at the Turner Contemporary in Margate. And it was room upon room of just beautiful, challenging artwork. It had politics, it had humor, it had deep personal um, memories. Um, it, it was everything to me. It was this beautiful exhibition. It was all these ceramics and these huge textile tapestries. And um, one particular piece stuck with me. It was called Map of Days. And um, it was basically Grayson commenting on psychology and different types of um, mental illness, but also going into his own experiences. And it was it was quite a comical piece. Um, he, he'd suddenly go from these deep emotions and this challenging of his gender and these sort of texts that would really provoke you. And then also suddenly just say some really random texts of something he'd heard on the radio. And it was just this really incredible piece. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do conventional portraits. And 
you know, when you're that age, you try lots of different art. I did oils, I did lots of different things. But there was something about doing this really unconventional portrait of the self that attracted me. Um, so yeah, my exhibition was lots of stuff like that, but um, I was 18 <laughs> um, and you have to make decisions about your life. And um, I came from a working class background. So I, I remember why the family members sort of saying to me, you know, your art's good, but don't go do that because <laughs> you know, you're good at other things. And I remember um, foolishly kind of believing that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I had a couple of bad relationships at the time as well. And I had people sort of discouraging me and that does affect you, especially at that age. Um, so um, I went on to do history at Warwick and um, I got onto this really good opportunity with um, Lloyds Bank. They did a um, scholarship program um, for people from sort of um, working class backgrounds, low income households, that sort of thing. And it was an incredible experience. Um, while I was at university, they offered me volunteering, um, two paid internships during my summers. Um, and it was great. It, it really was. Um, my first <laughs> my, my first summer um, uh, after my first year at university, um, I went to Edinburgh and I went on a plane for the first time. And I remember going to work in this this big, impressive building and it was very corporate and it was very exciting for me, actually. Um, but I remember that year at university, I sort of said to myself, um, and I really did care about my art. I said, if I can't do this professionally, I don't want to do it at all. And I put my pen down, <laughs> stubbornly. Um, and, and what a mistake, actually, because um, and my mental health did get quite bad, um, because that whole time I'd been drawing a lot. And really, that had been my coping mechanism. I'd lost that. And um, yeah, I, you know, I did develop well, I think it was always there, but officially develop things like anxiety. And um, yeah, I, I stopped doing the art. <laughs> um, I, I did a bit here and there, but but not, not much at all. And then I got to my second year of university and my second internship. And this time I went to Bristol, um, which was incredible. And I remember this pattern started again, where I was coming home from work every day and I was drawing. And I was drawing until the late hours and I'd been picking up all these objects um, like this teapot you can see here. And um, yeah, I just started drawing on them obsessively again. I was constantly doing it. And um, I had no problem with the work I was doing at the bank. It was, it was, it was good work and people were lovely. Um, there was nothing wrong with it. But when you're creative, you have a drive and you have a need to make. Um, I do believe that, I, I know that a lot of a lot of my colleagues, especially, they, they have that innate need to make. And um, I decided that I wasn't really done with my art and um, that after university, I would, I would pursue it again, um, which was a bold decision and really scary for me actually. Um, but I knew it was something I needed to do. So I go into my third year at Warwick um, and I do three really scary, but really important things. Um, I spoke to a careers advisor and said, how do I go from history to art? Can I do that? Can, can anyone be an artist? I, I've, I've missed out on this undergrad. <laughs> um, and, you know, she said, apply for a master's. So um, I applied for one in my hometown. It was a good course. Um, I'm still doing it now. I've got two months. Um, it's at UCA in Canterbury and, and I applied for that. And um, I also thought I need to start doing art regularly. I need to start getting in the headspace. Um, so I decided I'd start up a business under a pseudonym. Um, being an artist, you need to be, you know, you need to be present. You need to talk to people. You need to be able to talk about your practice. And I felt quite unconfident at this point. So I thought I'll do it under a pseudonym. And then it's kind of, it's my face, but it's not me. People don't know it's me. Um, so I set up Sophie Stokes and I applied for business funding for that. And then the third brave thing I did, um, I applied to go and teach in India. And um, this will make sense why I'm mentioning this later on. Um, and yeah, it, it worked out for me. I, I got onto the masters. Um, it was a horrible interview. I remember crying in it actually. <laughs> My course leader is a real character and um, 
you know, she said, why don't you just go and do another undergrad? And I said, well, I can't afford to do an undergrad, so, um, but I can afford the funding for a master's. Um, so yeah, I, I got onto that. Um, it was an agonizing two day wait. <laughs> um, um, and it was actually a pretty quick response um, considering. And um, I got the business funding for Sophie Stokes as well. And um, that whole year, and to this day, still I'm I'm working on it. Um, I, I developed um, this basic illustration brand. What I do is 100% um, recycled plastic jewelry, and it's all made from my own illustrations. And um, it's it's just amazing. It was really fun to do. It was a really fun thing, and it, it taught me so much about um the business side of art because no one tells you about that when you when you decide to be an artist no one tells you all the admin and there is so much you become your own accountant um your own publicist <laughs> you do all your own marketing you do all of it um and yeah that was a whole year of learning all of that and making all the mistakes <laughs> um and and lots of successes too um so yeah it, it worked out and then um, and I got further funding with that as well. So I still work, and that was with Warwick University. Um, I still work with them at the moment, um, developing that and also developing my art. They've been incredible. Um, and that third thing, going to India. Um, I went to go and teach um, just for a month. Um, and it was basically training teachers um, and just doing this sort of sustainable volunteering. And it had a really big impact on me actually um so i'll take you to the start of my ma and um show you some of what i do um so it's these really big um drawings of women generally um that they're, they're, they're self portraits but also portraits of women throughout history and um basically the concept behind my work is this idea of the beautiful surface but perhaps a more complex or difficult reality. And this comes from two important things. Um, from my own personal experience, um, as I mentioned with my family, we weren't very open growing up. We're very different now. I think we learn our lesson, but um, it's, you know, a lot of people, a lot of society, we have to be perfect. We have to um, not show our vulnerable side and we have to be, you know, we live in a very beautiful age of Instagram and and surfaces. And, and there's a lot beneath that. There's a lot of difficulty, a lot of struggle that we don't talk about. And um, when I went to India, one, one thing I did um, with some of the other female volunteers I worked with, um, we were training teachers our age. Our age. We weren't going there as a sort of uh, we're superior thing because I'm not a qualified teacher. But what we were going there as, um, was with this sort of this privilege education you get in the UK and you get a lot of creative learning methods. So we were just going to, to offer some confidence boosting and just some advice really. And um, there were loads of women my age we taught every day and we thought, why don't we do some women's only sessions? Because it would be really interesting to learn a bit more about um, different attitudes to certain things. And um, they were they were great sessions. We we learned a lot about you know just attitudes to periods, to marriage, to careers. And um, one shocking thing that has stuck with me was um, when I asked the room, um, you know, is, is anyone sort of experienced or witnessed domestic violence? And um, it was a room of twenty women that I worked with every day, and every one of them put their hand up. So each one of these women had experienced or witnessed domestic violence. And I just remember feeling quite shocked and maybe in a naive way, I don't know, but just these, these, lovely, <laughs> these lovely girls coming in every day, dressed immaculately, beautifully, smiling at me, joking, just being so wonderful and so positive. And they dealt with all this difficulty. And it just showed so much strength and so much it was incredible to me and that's that stuck with me that I think everyone you know hides a lot of stuff about themselves and and I hope my work shows a bit of that vulnerability and a bit of that also that that surface that, that we all put forward 
Um, so the piece um, on your left here, um, this is called In Flowers and it's about being, um, I, I guess um, it draws upon the themes in my work of, of being immersed in nature. And um, I, I look a lot to literature, Robert Frost, um, he speaks about the woods as this safe space away from the horrors of society, of, of capitalism, of the, as this space where we can just breathe and we can be in the moment. And also um, in Metamorphosis, um, Ava describes Daphne running away um, from Apollo. She's escaping rape. And um, what she does is she transforms um, into a tree. And I love this idea of um, just becoming part of nature and being immersed in it and, and having it as, as this safe space um, for learning, for, for freedom. Um, and I exclusively um, draw women within my practice as well to create that sense of safety, I guess. Um, one thing I, I was worried about with my practice was it was too pretty. And um, sometimes I realize um, as with any art, it can take a while to really understand what it's about. Um, even sometimes when I make my own work, it can take a few months to really fully understand what it meant. And for me, um, I read a really interesting writer called Stephen Levine, and um, he talks about art therapy. And he describes this process of poesis, which is basically using the materials around us to shape different versions um, of the world, to create things that give us knowledge that we couldn't otherwise access. And I think in my work, there is this kind of this indescribable pain, these things, these things we can't communicate. Um, but we can show in, in that there is that value within the art. Um, I'm also, um, yeah, these are some more examples um, of my work here. And um, the middle one's called Caught and Displayed. It's, um, it's a poor quality image, I'm afraid, but it's, um, it's a very big piece. <laughs> um, but it's, it's all these women trapped within this peacock and, um, it's quite disturbing. It's kind of inspired by Aubrey Beardsley, actually. I'm, I'm deeply inspired by his drawings. He's a Victorian artist. Um, and I love that detail, actually. There's something very um, relentless about some of my pieces, especially the one on the left. Um, it's, it's called Lost in Translation. And it's kind of this um, almost horrible <laughs> level of detail. It, it comes out at you and it's, um, I read a book called Radical Decadence and it's about this overt femininity like shoving it in people's faces and and um and also for me um the process of my work the, the literal um act of pen to paper is this cathartic release of energy and negativity and bringing it into something positive but the busyness of pieces like that I think often reflect the busyness of the mind um it's almost releasing that somehow. Um, I'm also inspired by artists like um, Yoyoi Kasama and um, her, her process is one called obliteration, which, which I love. It's also deeply sad, but it's um, the process of continually making to sort of obliterate that trauma that you've been through. Um, and she's had quite a difficult life, um, but it's a similar concept to, to what she's doing there really. Um, I've also read um, Adorno. Um, this is the only theory, by the way. I'm just, I'm just giving you the context. <laughs> it's not an academic talk. Um, but Adorno as well, um, he speaks about art as, as giving us this unique knowledge um, and that's unattainable. And um, as a history student as well, um, as you'll see in my practice, it absolutely seeps into everything I do. And, um, it's interesting to think um, in my dissertation that actually the work I was making, the act of being a woman and um, making work about the self, actually putting pen to paper and saying that your life is interesting enough or worthwhile is a really deeply political act. And it's something that, you know, Frida Kahlo was doing with her paintings. She was documenting her life and um, think of how many people she's inspired by doing that. But I think of all the women, whose stories get forgotten 
um, that was one big thing with Sophie Stokes as well when I developed that was um, there are loads of creative women in my family um, and I guess it depends on what you define creativity as but my, my nan used to work in a, um, a Cindy factory and Cindy's were these dolls from the 70s and um, she used to sew their clothes and before that um, my great nan she worked in a she was a ceramicist and she used to paint the ceramics and um, sign them off and um, in, in a Kent factory and I think of all those those unspoken creatives we, we forget about um, but yeah um, Adorno basically argues that each piece of art comes with it this whole series of, of history um, being a female artist you, you enter that narrative automatically whether you want to or not um, it's there and you're part of it and um, I find that really exciting as well and um, I guess um, he says when you, when you look into art it's this idea of this indirect contemplation that something so beautiful can actually allow us um, give us the mental space to access thoughts we wouldn't otherwise get to um, so let's go forward to lockdown one <laughs> I don't really want to define things in terms of COVID, but sadly, my early career has has definitely been COVID's part of it. Um, and then, oh, what have I done? <laughs> in lockdown, um, in lockdown one, I just started to go back to my ceramics, and um, I, I'd picked up loads of them before the before the lockdown. I had all these teapots, these plates, cups, and um, I just went into this kind of decadently black and white detailed series of work. It's an installation of over 30 pieces. Um, when I get obsessed with something, it, it sticks. <laughs> You'll see that with the Russian dolls later. Um, but um, each piece is, is this individual moment in history. Um, so the process was, um, if I was feeling a particular emotion, didn't have to be negative, I would write down the text um, on the on the ceramic and then the picture would form around it and um especially um this particular plate um, no one ever joins me here i think it really represents that that loneliness of that period in time um and also i i guess that 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 feeling mentally when you're feeling down and you think no one could ever possibly um understand how i'm feeling and um, this whole body of work, again, it, it really is deeply inspired by Aubrey Beardsley, but it's also got this sense of some of the women have got these like peacock style headdresses and it's, it's almost got this 1920s party feel to it as well. Um, there's something historical about my work, um, even when I'm talking about the present and about myself. And I, I do think about these objects I picked up, um, they've already had a history before I've even drawn on them and um, I love that idea of using something so found, found and mundane um, you know vases and, and plates and teacups they aren't high art um, but using them and, and giving them that purpose is really interesting for me um, I really enjoy doing that so um, we go into the summer of 2020 and um, I go on to my first artist residency um, with the Cordula Gallery um, in Massachusetts and it was a lockdown so sadly I couldn't go there um, but I did um, I worked with incredible um, American artists and writers actually and the whole residency was based on joy as a concept and it came about um, due to um, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and basically um, it was this idea of, of saying that joy is something that we can use to sustain us. Joy isn't this meaningless act of being happy. Joy is um, being grateful, it's showing gratitude. And it is um, giving us the strength to maintain political activism, but also personal struggle and personal um, issues as well. And there was a whole variety of us from a different, different backgrounds coming into it. And it was a really collaborative um, two months where we'd meet up, we'd do crits, we'd talk to each other. And um, it, it was incredible. And I decided I'd been doing a lot of black and white work and I really needed 
to try and use colour um, and do something out of my comfort zone. So I read a book called Chromophobia and it basically goes through, you know, you can use colour for purpose, you, you know, with purpose and it can be meaningful. And these are just some um, smaller pieces and drafts of work that I was doing um, at that time. Um, but also um, the piece in Flowers was made during this residency and that was sort of the big piece from that. And I think by that point, I'd learned how to bring in that darkness, um, but also have a bit of colour and a, a bit of life into it. And, and I think that's it, it adds an important dimension to the work. Um, but it was a brilliant residency. And um, I'll go on to um, my Russian dolls. Um, I did an exhibition with some colleagues at the 3537 Gallery. It's a small... Um, experimental gallery in Folkestone in Kent and um, it's it was really fun and I, I, um, I made these wooden Russian dolls I made a set of 15 and each of them basically represented three generations of women in my family so um, it had my my nan's generation and she's her relationship with my granddad is quite old-fashioned she does everything for him um, she cooks for him she cleans for him um, and she also worked as well as that. Um, and it explores that. And then it goes on to my mum's generation. And um, my mum was born in 1972 and she, she went on to marry, well, not marry, um, to, to cohabit and have, have kids quite young in, in her early 20s. And um, that, that changed her life because, you know, she did sacrifice a career. She sacrificed a lot of things, a lot of experiences, a lot of traveling, a lot of. Um, things that we assume young people should be doing. And, um, but it was a different time. Um, even though it's not too far ago, um, it was a different time. And then I, the third set was um, about me and my generation. And honestly, um, I don't know yet. I, I don't know what, what the impact of, you know, growing up, they say trauma and, and different experiences are inherited, but I, I wonder which ones, which ones will and, and how, um, my experience of womanhood will be different from from my mum's or from my from my nan's and um these Russian dolls went down really well <laughs> um, which I was really happy about I didn't expect it to um my mum was a doll collector actually so I I, I like my, my figures are quite doll like actually everything I draw and I think it's definitely to do with that I've realized that recently um but um it's really in incredible and I I, I love I love listening to all her stories about where she got them and um obviously dolls are contentious I think in terms of feminism but um the Russian doll to me was this almost desexualized figure I quite liked it it doesn't have any it's not like a Barbie doll or something it's it's kind of separate from that and we went into another lockdown <laughs> and um I was sitting in my studio and I had this 10 kilogram bag of clay I, I got it I'd I was thinking at some point, clay is really nice to work with. It's really relaxing. I'll probably use it and it won't be anything to do with my main practice. I'll just use it for fun. And um, I remember sitting there and thinking, wouldn't it be cool to make clay Russian dolls? Because these ones I used before, they were pre-made. I painted and, and drawn on them, but they slotted into each other and they weren't individuals. And I thought, how, how amazing to actually make something so organic and, and individual but couldn't slot into other into the other dolls so I started um, and a bit like the ceramics one doll turned into 50 <laughs> um, and um, these are the clay ones you're looking at now and each of these dolls um, for me represents almost um, untold stories of women and all you can see is their eyes and, and their face. And I, I remember um, in India, um, as well as the teaching we did, the, the farm I lived, I lived on a farm during this time, uh, in rural India, and um, it was also a textile um, collective just for women, um, a really safe space for them to come and work. And I, I remember as well, um, especially after that conversation I had with the younger women, looking at some of the older, uh, older women I was around every day and, and they'd smile, but, I think you can look into people's eyes and you can you can see you, you can see their experiences and I could I could really tell there was pain and um 
with these dolls that the best bit was drawing the faces and some of them I had a bit of fun with some of them look a bit alien <laughs> but some of them um you know that they, they really tell these stories and these um yeah that they have a pain to them some of them I think especially um there's one um if you if you go on my Instagram at any point I always photograph this particular one I've got a favorite <laughs> And um, her eyes um, look like a 1920s sort of black and white film actress. And she's got these really doe eyes and there's, it's kind of beautiful, but there's also that kind of pain there. Um, and um, these went into a Pal Fanet exhibition. So Pal Fanet is an organization in Kent um, that just um, celebrates women really. Um, it's a really lovely arts organization. And I, I worked with them in 2020. Um, I showed the tea set that was right at the beginning. Um, that was to do with India actually, that tea set and um, the stories of the women I met. Um, but in 2021, um, it was a real privilege actually and really exciting to be asked to come and co-curate an exhibition. And um, we actually, did an exhibition about the Green and Women. And the Green and Women um, were campaigning against um, nuclear violence in the 70s, nuclear war. And um, it was, um, we, we basically got in two photographers and one fine artist and all three of them had been at Green and protesting or they're just documenting it. Um, and then I came in as this sort of contemporary voice and contemporary perspective um, on Greenham. And I, I, as it was quite a good opportunity to use my history um, degree with my art, which is always exciting for me. Um, and I ended up putting in these Russian dolls and I put those in because I thought about um, all these all these amazing women that would have campaigned. And I, and I wonder how many um, actual sort of micro histories. I am so sorry if you can hear my cat in the background, he's very loud. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, all these all these micro histories um, of women that and case studies that we might not have all these stories. Um, so that was about them. But then I also put in my piece in flux. And in flux is one of these female utopias that I created when I was creating these disastrously but also wonderfully detailed big pieces of work. And um, it was basically in relation to um, the campsites that the Green and Women lived on. So they basically kind of abandoned their homes, um, left the men with the children and went there to live in these kind of socialist utopias. And they'd have their own politics and um, financial systems within the camps. And I, I watched a few documentaries on it and some firsthand ones with interviews from the women. And um, what I really loved about the camps was that they were these spaces to have all kinds of conversations and they would be talking about, um, about marriage, about whether it was okay to leave their children at home, whether they were being bad mothers by campaigning. Um, they were talking about sexuality, they were talking about careers. Um, and what really shook me, and I had this, um, on my degree actually when, when I was I studied a lot of women in the 70s um, through that but, but what really stuck with me was the conversations they were having the problems they had weren't too dissimilar from women now and that really stuck with me and it's actually quite um, a difficult thought actually that in 50 years not too much has changed um, so I wanted to celebrate those camps as those spaces for those conversations and conversations that we're still having and actually turn it into a positive thing that there's still things that can be done and, and that we will do, that will get better for people, for women, um, but also for everyone. And um, yeah, I was I was really inspired by documentaries and they were hilarious these, these women. They they used to they used to do all these interventions with um, newsreaders and do handstands in the background and they'd all dress up in crazy outfits and it it was it was incredibly political a lot of what they were doing, but also the the kind of interventions they, they were they were quite funny. Um and that experience um really cemented this connection, I think between history and art within my practice. And um, 
I was really lucky to get onto um, a residency with Jane Austen's house. Um, so you may not know Jane Austen house is in Chawton um, in Hampshire and it was where Jane Austen lived for the last eight years of her life. And um, it's where she wrote some of her key novels. Um, it's where she wrote endless, very bitchy letters to her sister. Um, it was um, an incredible space. And um, I was invited to go on this residency and I'm still on it. Um, if you do want to learn more about this, I will talk a bit about it now, but I'm doing a talk on Wednesday with Jane Austen House. Um, specifically just about uh, my experiences with Jane over the last three months and I say it like I know her but you, you do begin to feel like you know her I've spent um, a very intense amount of time looking through archives rereading all the novels and um, watching all the period dramas um, and just really immersing myself in the life of Jane and what I was asked to do really was just to come in and look at the archives and see if there was any new perspectives on Jane Austen that I might be able to offer visually. And um, one thing that struck me was I think when people think Jane Austen, they think that she was quite privileged, that she was um, drinking tea, going to lots of ballrooms um, and she was very genteel. But actually Jane Austen was this incredibly um, practical, down to earth um, woman and she, she wasn't, that privileged and um, her brothers admittedly did go and live on big estates but due to the way inheritance worked at that time none of that money went to Jane her sister or her mother once her father died um but yeah she, she was incredible she um she'd make her own ink um she'd have to crush her own ink and predict when she'd need more and that would take two weeks to do um she had her own livestock um but she and and the other women she lived with would have had to sort of um, you know, nurturing and, and kill if, if they wanted to eat it and um, producing produce. They had a whole garden just for dyes to dye their own fabric. Um, Jane Austen also, she played the piano every day. Um, she would sew, she was just immensely talented as well as her writing. And um, her brothers had lots of children. So she was also a very loving auntie. Um, so she was incredible. She did a lot in her short life. And um, one thing in the first month of my residency, I, I wanted to think about was um, her writing room and in Jane's writing room, um, which you can go and see, and I would recommend. And if you're far away, um, they do virtual residencies, which are uh, uh, virtual um, tours and they're incredible. I think they're only five pound and I've done one and it was just, um, it was it was as good as going and seeing it actually you still get a lot from it um yeah but this this writing room and there's this wallpaper called Chawton Leaf and um it's this really beautiful it's a bit like what I've drawn here on the left um this green vibrant wallpaper and she's there in the corner with her writing desk and um, the brilliant thing about the writing room um was that if anyone walked near the door would creak and she could, she could hear them coming. So what she would do is she'd clutch her book or her letter close to her chest because she didn't want anyone to see what she was doing until she was ready. She was very secretive. And of course, in her lifetime, she didn't go by Jane Austen. She used a pseudonym. Um, so people didn't know it was a female writer. And um, I just love this idea of um, this wallpaper, being with her in all those moments, that wallpaper, um, I began to think of it as this almost this living object that watched her. It watched her write Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility. It was with her through every moment, through every um, dark thought, through thinking about um, relationships and romance in Regency England. Um, it was there through everything with her. It was this intimate companion of Jane that knew her better than we could ever know, know her. Um, and I love this idea of her becoming immersed in this room and this space. Virginia Woolf talks about every woman needing a room of her own to work. And it's something that um, the film director, Sally Potter's played on as well. And um, Jane truly did have this room of her own. They'd also used the room for dining, but when she was writing it, it, it was there, she was alone. Um, and yeah, it was there, it, it knew the true Jane because 
it was there while she was writing all these letters and we have 150 of these letters left um but she used to be so horrible about <laughs> about people about um plays she loved the theater she knew all the actors and actresses um and she she could be really nasty <laughs> and uh, i think to save grace um cassandra her sister did burn most letters but we have 150 and we can get a pretty good idea of um <laughs> of jane through those um it would have been fantastic to have more but um but yeah this wallpaper was out with, with everything so it, it was a really good start to the residency to make that and also i was doing a challenge called 30 works at the time it was a piece of art every day for 30 days um so i was just playing around with the characters of jane austen drawing them and it all sort of visually helped me get into the headspace of jane's world um I particularly love Emma um, just because she's this really imperfect and, and human character and um, also Emma had a really good relationship with her dad um, which Jane Austen did and um, Jane Austen and Austen's dad um, let her have access to this huge library he'd buy her notebooks and pens he was so supportive when he was alive um, and it was always assumed that Jane would be a writer um, he, he, he was, um, it's, it's quite rare for the time as well. I just think it's a nice thing to share. That, um, it's not always, you can't just make generalizations about a period actually. Um, the second month, um, I started to think about Jane Austen and the seaside and um, Jane Austen, um, when writing about the sea, it would actually be represented as this place for sexuality, for looseness, um, for freedom. And this vase shows some of the key activities and things women would get up to at the seaside. Um, I'll start from um, the left. So in the pink dress, um, this is a scene from Persuasion um, when um, <laughs> the girl, she, she jumps off the steps at Lyme Regis and she keeps doing it. She keeps jumping into the into the male character's arms and um, it's quite a flirtatious thing to do in that period anyway um but then it goes wrong for her and she she falls and she hits her head and um it's, it's quite shocking actually when i read it I, I read persuasion for the first time during this residency um so i called the vase after that i called it leap of faith this whole vase because with Jane Austen and the seaside, I feel like the seaside was this place to take risks and to do things differently. Jane herself allegedly had some romances at the seaside. Um, obviously, if the letters destroyed, we'll never truly know the full extent of those. Um, but yeah, women would splash about in the sea. Um, they'd do lots of swimming. They'd wear clothing that was slightly more revealing. And it was also in the novels a place um, for women to become um sexually viable candidates are a place where women would be pursued um you, you have it with with willoughby and sense and sensibility um and it, and in pride and prejudice as well actually um with mr darcy um and his, his sister is pursued at the seaside and um yeah it's this place of sexual awakening and as well as that, um, women would also go and gamble. And if you look closely, you'll see the women are holding these tiny fish and that's kind of the shape they were. Um, you can look on the Jane Austen website and they were called gambling fish and there'd be these things for, that you'd win when you played different games. Um, but yeah, uh, and as a teenager as well, um, Jane used to write about all kinds of shocking things. She'd write about, um shocking for the time maybe not for today but you know women absolutely gorging and, and overeating and women um running off with their best friend's boyfriend or potential fiance and um just all kinds of things and as a teenager she used to really play about with genre and it was really exciting that leads me on to right now today um so I'm currently working on this body of work that I think teenage Jane would be really fond of because she loved all things gothic and a bit and a bit disturbed. And um, there is certainly an element of that in this body of work. Um, this is this is for my degree show, and it really goes back to that piece in flowers. I found there was a power to just focusing on one or two figures. And I started thinking about duality. I thought about pieces like the two Fridas 
and this idea of contemplation and I think really I wanted to bring it back to the self for my degree show I really wanted to um, put the history aside for a bit and think about um, my relationship with my mental health and how there's these kind of two 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 beings almost these two personalities there's that very um, kind of ambitious and, and driven side and there's also that side of the self-doubt but somehow they maintain each other and um, I've mentioned Sally Potter she, she's a fantastic British um, director by the way but um, one of her films The Tango Lesson and, and it's about the tango and um, this kind of dynamic of the dance and I, I started to think about those poses when I was um, developing this body of work and um, that kind of struggle between two people. And I thought of that as the struggle um, in my head sometimes. Um, I was also told, um, I, I do a lot of the body. I was told if you're going to do the body, do it full size. Um, so you'll notice that very big piece is actually seven foot. Um, and it's the biggest piece I've done to date. Um, I work quite big anywhere, usually at least day one. Um, so it's exciting to go even bigger with the scale for the degree show. Um, but also my process is um, quite chaotic. When you see my finished work, you think, oh, she must be so meticulous and organised. Um, it's actually chaos. Um, it's, I, I, I like to have several pieces going on at once because I find they're then in conversation with each other, especially with this body of work, because it's um, that they kind of inform each other and as they develop the others I, I then get inspiration for the others and I, I like to leave work to, to one side and think about it for a while and and have that space to to, to breathe and, and to think about it rather than rushing every piece um, and yeah it, it's, it's, it's an exciting body of work I can't fully um, give you like a, a description of what it all means yet because as, as I've said you know it, it, it takes me um, a bit of time to fully understand and take in what I've done but definitely it comes into it a lot of the themes that have built up over the last two years and um, it's going back to something deeply personal and um, definitely you'll see the completed piece on the right and um, it felt very emotional when that one was complete. There's something about it. Um, definitely pieces like that. I feel like you do put a bit of yourself into it. Um, so that's all for the main talk. Um, I hope you've got questions. I'm really happy to answer anything. Um, I'm going to leave it on this screen or we might come off for a discussion. I'll let Kirsty decide. But basically, um, yeah, please come and say hello. I'm, I'm on Instagram, um, I'm on Facebook, um, and I've got a website, which is a portfolio. It will be a shop at some point soon. Um, I'm working on it. And also I'll have a Patreon as well um, very soon. So um, I'd love for you to stay in touch and, and yeah, please say hello. Thank that you. That was fantastic. Um, uh, <laughs> where to start? I mean, it's you're talking about all these inspiring women of the past, but at, but really right in front of us, you're incredibly inspiring to women um, because the way that you are using your mental health to be able to really push your artwork, the way that you're able to just take that leap of faith, ignore everyone else and go, I'm going to be an artist, I am going to do this and I'll do it for myself. Um, it's just incredibly inspiring and it's so beautiful to actually see people do this. Mm. Thank you. Um, and there was there was one bit that really hit me and uh, with that woman's group in India that every single woman's put their hand up and they say that really in England most women have experienced sexual harassment rape or have witnessed something like that um so it's it's one of these things where unless we opened our eyes we won't know what's going on um, I think that's one of the one of the most important things in your artwork is bringing that teaching to us. Um, and yeah, there was there was a couple of questions as we were going through. Um, so with your residencies, um, how has working in different environments and different places affected your artwork? Well, um, with the Cordial Eye Gallery. Um, 
it, it was digital, but working with American artists was just such a positive experience that um, they were just so honest and um, really encouraging and positive. And actually um, doing a group residency is such a valuable thing because you do find um, you bounce off each other. And I'm still in contact with, with quite a few of the artists now. And um, one of them, she's an incredible sort of feminist photographer. And um, our practices are very different, but also um, we have such similar interests that um, I, I still find myself inspired. So actually, um, I think it just broadens your horizons and, and makes you think a bit differently. And um, with Jane Austen House, again, it's been digital, but um, I have been to the house and um, what I found from that was, um, I mean, I, I think I'm obsessed with Jane Austen now. Um, and it's it's all down to um, Sophie Reynolds, the curator, and also Lizzie Dunford, um, two incredible members of staff at the house who just come at you with all this knowledge and information. And if you if you have any inquiry about a small bit of Jane, they will they will come back at you with 10 sources relating to it. Um, so I think um, I think that residency in particular has taught me just you know really read, immerse in literature, um, watch watch TV, watch films, um, and just learn from it. And um, and there's value in that. It's just research is so important. It's such an important thing. And um, I, actually, I'm sure a lot of artists. Um, so much thought goes into any work before you even begin to produce it. Mm. I think that's really really good advice actually with reading um I mean especially going back to the time in Jane Austen it would have been rare for a woman to be able to have read and write and be given the opportunities that she had without that supportive family um and there was an another question um I write so many notes it's ridiculous <laughs> um so how did you manage to get yourself to have that willpower to go to the careers advice and decide, you know what, I'm going to be an artist, I'm going to change my career completely? Um, I think I think I just had a point of, of realisation in Bristol, you know, I was making the art every night and I, I guess I just thought, um, I'd love to do this all the time. <laughs> and um, yeah, as, as naive as that was, I guess, but um, that 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 was that was the thought. I thought, well, why can't I? Surely, if I if I talk to someone and I put the work in and find out how, it's a possibility. Um, but you only find out through asking. So I just thought I'd find out more and see see if it was something I could do. And yeah, it turned out it was. So yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, and I assume everyone is supportive now that they're seeing how great you are and how fast you're rolling with it all. Well, my, my close family have always been um, incredibly supportive. Um, like, I mean, amazingly so. Um, I, I currently, my, my studio, it's, it's a spare room in the house. Um, and my dad's very kindly <laughs> um, let me do that. And that's, that's amazing. Um, and yeah, I think the wider family, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, all my friends and everyone, it's, people are supportive and I think one thing that you do learn to do and um, this goes for any any walk of life you're in but you do learn um, to keep your network um, positive and to keep the people around you people that will criticize you and push you but not in a negative way you want people that will bring you up and um, as you get older you, you, you learn you learn I think you learn that I think yeah that's actually brilliant and um, a lot of being an artist is really learning as you go the amount of mistakes I've made um, going forward I won't be making again or adapting um, what's your biggest advice um, to budding artists out there okay um, oh it's a tough one I, we really are winging it everyone's winging it even um I think even I, I look at people and I think oh they're so successful how will I ever get to be like them and I just everyone I speak to is just learning as they go um my, my key advice um I think just just have a sense of balance and um don't don't put too much on yourself don't expect to be um 
don't don't expect to be successful overnight just 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 learn to build that resilience um le learn about rejection learn um yeah learn how to be happy with yourself and then um i think things don't affect you as much and you, you can you can build up that resilience to keep going and you know and to give things a go mm. That's fantastic advice. It really is. Um, everyone really is winging it. Um, some people just put a very glossy coat on top. Um, and I, I really have to say from the bottom of my heart, everything you're doing is just phenomenal. Um, not just as artists, but as, as, as a woman, like you really are pushing yourself out there. And without intending to shove it in people's faces, you're making points and making people listen. And that's really what's needed, um, especially in these day of ages. And it's really interesting what you said that 50 years ago, we're still fighting the same fight, really. Um, and I mean, not really related to women, but in LGBTQIA+, still looking at that in Europe, there are over 100 places they're banned from going. Um, and well, <laughs> this next question is quite a big one from the audience is, what would you say would be, well, how can you change it, basically? How can we change this viewpoint to be able to actually make progression? I think, um, you know, all, all change starts with yourself and um, all, all, all we can ever, you know, we can always um, behave and act in ways that, that, we, that we think the world should be, but um, I... I know my work does have sort of, you know, it does, it does have a political message behind it um, a lot of the time, but um, I don't, I don't necessarily um, look to actively change minds. I think, um, I mean, gosh, that's, that's such a big question, isn't it? Um, I, I think, <laughs> oh, I wish I had the answer. Um, I think, I think, you know, we, we just do, do good, do good in, in your day-to-day -day life and do good through the actions you do. And um, hopefully, hopefully you do inspire or, or make make people think or question. But also, I, I think it's just key to never to never think um, we're. You, you have to be open to all viewpoints. You have to be open, and um, to completely dismiss anyone or their viewpoint is can be unproductive. So I think you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. Uh, one person might seem small, but if a million people did the same thing, it would actually cause quite a big change. Um, and thank you so much for being here today to talk about your creative practice. I am, I am myself as well as the audience has found it incredibly interesting. Um, and everyone, please do follow Molly Lambert on Instagram, Facebook, and keep up to date for when her shop and Patreon comes along and support her. Um, without you guys, artists wouldn't really <laughs> be able to thrive and survive. Um, so thank you so much, Molly, for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone who's come along. I really appreciate it. <laughs> OK, then um, I'll see you soon and keep safe and keep well. Bye. Bye.